uh, also the podium there. Union Agenda 2063. Further global developments, such as those reflected in the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, were also considered. This ensures the policy recommendations are in the context of things that are actually taking place at this time nationally, regionally, as well as globally. The report therefore covers macroeconomic performance and prospects, food supply and manufacturing, labor and credit markets, and trade. Additionally, the report considers adoption of environment-friendly e-mobility as an alternative to the more costly fossil fuel vehicles. Further, the role of government in fostering well-functioning markets in, in critical areas such as healthcare, transport, housing are also considered. As you can see, these are key channels through which cost of living is impacted. The areas covered also reflects on the inclusivity in line with the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, Kipra remains committed to delivering on its core mandate of generating objective evidence informed policy recommendations to inform our national development agenda. The Kipra Board sincerely thanks our parent ministry, the National Treasury and Economic Planning for the cordial, exceptional support in ensuring the Institute delivers on the mandates as public policy think tank and policy advisor. On its part, the Kipra Board of Directors will continue to provide the required oversight and strategic directions in developing the core mandate of the Institute. I assure our stakeholders that the Board, through its programs committee, provided the required oversight, guidance and support in the preparation of the Kenya Economic Report 2023, from identification of the theme to the finalization and dissemination. Soon after this launch workshop, the Institute will embark on a series of targeted sectoral disseminations and in-depth policy discourse informed by the Kenya Economic Report 2023. This will provide opportunities to delve into deeper discussions on the findings of the report, emerging issues and implementation details of the recommendations. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, on behalf of the Kipra Board of Directors, we are honored to have your participation in this launch of the Kenya Economic Report 2023. Immediately after this launch, the report will be available, as you have been told, in the Kipra Public Policy Repository. You will also be able to access the full report, the popular version, policy brief, and inf infograph version. I also urge all to visit the Kipra website to access the report and share the report with your networks. Let me conclude, let me congratulate Kipra team led by Mr. Adan Shibia for timely preparation of this report under the leadership of the Director Economic Management, Dr. Elda Onsomu, and the Executive Director, Dr. Rose Ngugi. Once again, Karibuni Sana, and I thank you for honoring our invitation. Now, with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me call upon our principal, our, our, our principal guest, Mr. James Muhati, the PS State Department for Economic Planning, to make his remarks and welcome our chief guest. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, I want to recognize the presence of the Cabinet Secretary uh, for National Treasury and Economic Planning, uh, Professor Juguna Ndungu, uh, the representatives of my fellow principal secretaries who are here, uh, 
the chair of the Kipra board, Professor Benson Lateng, uh, the board members uh, of Kipra, uh, the executive director of Kipra, Dr. Ros Ngugi, uh, the directors of Kipra, CEOs present, uh, representatives from the private sector and development partners, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Yeah, I'm pleased uh, to join you this morning uh, during the launch of uh, the Kenya Economic uh, report, report uh, which is themed uh, the cost of living and role of markets. And mine uh, this morning is to actually congratulate uh, Kipra uh, for uh, coming out with these uh, statutory reports uh, at such a time as this that is going to inform uh, uh, how we will we need to deal with, with the issues around uh, the cost of living. So I don't want to take much time because the chief guest is here and I'm honored this morning uh, to welcome uh, Professor Njuguna Ndungu, the Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury, uh, to make his keynote address and be able to unveil uh, the contents of this report to us that we are all eager to hear this morning. Uh, so, sir, you're welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I realize that everybody shifted this side, and that side is uh, quite thin. And, uh, or is it the early morning? Let me start by acknowledging uh, my peers for State Department for Economic Planning, Mr. James Mohati. I don't know whether we have any principal secretaries here who came to celebrate with us the Kenya Economic Report. But more importantly, let me also recognize my friend and chairman of the Kipra Board, Chair, uh, Kipra Board Dr. Benson Aten. Thank you very much for reading the way. The Kipra Board members that are present, let me also recognize the executive director of Kipra, Dr. Rose Google. Let me also recognize chief executive officers who may be present, the private sector representatives, the development partners present, members of the media, distinguished guests. I'm also recognizing my friend Dominic Jenkel, Professor Dominic Jenkel, who is temporarily taking over my previous outfit, the African Economic Research Consortium, which has been supporting national think tanks as one of the objectives so that we create a very formidable platform for policy influence with the th national think tanks. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm happy to be home and uh, most of you who don't know the history, I'm one of those people who were invited to help set up Kipra in 1999. But of course, I hope I'm not revealing my age. Huh? <laughs> And uh, I have I had several responsibilities, and I'm happy since then that Kipra has grown, has supported the public policy space, and continue to advise the government in diverse ways. One of the instruments that James Muhati, the PS the Economic Planning, uses is actually the macro model for Kenya that was set up that time as one of my assignments. And uh, it's also interesting to note that most of the key people you find, whether it's in Kipra, Rosgoge, or in government, were actually working for me that time to create and develop the macro model. So, James, those 266 equations that spins your head were created by me 
and uh, we actually made sure because we don't want to trouble the treasury so much we created a server in uh, an excel worksheet so that you can actually run scenarios so we have had the technology in Kipra and we continue to to, 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 to move in that space of expertise, to train capacity, so that we can advise policy. I'm a fan of talking about policy, and even advising policy, and technical details, but sometimes, of course, the teacher in me comes in. I'm sure some of the people in the audience have been unfortunate to be in my hands in class, but at least, they serve us, but they sing praises of what they do today because of that. Let me start by saying that it's my great honor to join you this morning in launching the Kenya Economic Report 2023. And Kipra has been producing this statutory flagship report annually since 2009. As we launch this 15th edition of uh, uh, I'm just happy to note that the Kenya Economic Report has been instrumental in informing policy decisions for medium-term and long-term planning. But it's also noticed, as we notice, that it's also important to use this report in terms of policy advice, but more importantly, actually to try and explain and even showcase what is happening. Most of the time, most of us read newspapers, we listen to commentaries, and we feel like what has happened to the world grows, isn't it? What has happened? I'm not going to write an article if I don't have the facts, isn't it? I'm not going to talk about a subject matter if I don't know the subject matter. We used to call it the rules of the game, isn't it? The clear doctrine. Of reading articles, listening to discussions from very uninformed position. So that's why I'm actually arguing that this report comes in, we should use it, it should inform our debate. The launch of the Kenya Economic Report 2023 has a nice theme, cost of living and the role of markets. It is timely for policymakers because we are all seeking for evidence-based policy options to guide policy decisions to address the high cost of living for Kenyans. As the economy was recovering from the ravages of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it was also hit by a drought and disruptions of global supply chains that worsened the situation. And so what we have seen are negative and persistent shocks that have created permanent effects. In economics, Mr. Chairman, we would say that they are creating a structural effect. But most of my colleagues have told me, please, when you talk, please try to talk English so that we can understand English. So let's, let me say that some of this, most of the time when we were teaching, even when we advice on economic policy, we actually say that most of the anticipation is that if you have a negative shock, it is actually to be likely to be short term. That is always our thinking. But if you have a positive shock, it's likely to last long, isn't it? It's transitory. So a negative shock should be transitory, a positive shock should be permanent. But that's not how the, the real world works, isn't it? So when negative shocks become persistent, it means that you lose track of predictability of what will happen and they create a permanent effect. And you need some active reforms to remove yourself from that structural or permanent effect. We do believe that it's a policy issue, it's a reform issue, that we really need to think about so that we move out of that permanent effect. But the most important thing is that it's to expound then how do we get out of that kind of permanent effect 
How do we ignite economic recovery, resolve the cost of living, and also ignite growth and vibrancy? That's why we have the bottom-up economic transformation agenda for the current administration, and it is geared towards realizing an economic turnaround and achieving inclusive growth. Boosting domestic supply and ensuring that markets work if effectively are critical steps towards improving the living standards for Kenyans, especially those at the bottom of the pyramid. As such, the Kenyan Economic Report that we are launching today is aligned to the government policy initiatives around these priorities. Ladies and gentlemen, we, start, we can start asking our questions, uh, some questions about the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. One of the questions I was anticipating that I would be asked anywhere in the streets is why bottom-up? You know, I am capable of being asked so many questions. I remember when I joined the Central Bank in 2007, and the economy was growing at around 7 point something percent. I think somebody asked me one time in the streets asking me, we can't feel the growth. And the teacher in me always wake, woke up and I said, you cannot feel the growth because it's not like a bus that you wait for the bus at the bus station and then you enter. You have to be in the market. You have to be a participant in the market. That's where vibrancy is felt. But if you're outside the market, you cannot feel that. So that's why it is important to ask ourselves questions. Because once you ask questions, you can get some specific answers. So I start with why bottom up? The, dear, the new administration is concerned with the problems that have led many Kenyans to sink into abject poverty. One of the identified problems is the market capture, so that those at the bottom of the pyramid do not get returns for their sweat and investment. For instance, today we can talk, we can ask ourselves three questions. What happened to the vibrant sugar growing regions, for example? What happened to coffee? I always remind people that it's an emotional issue because people like us, German, we went to school because there was coffee. Okay? The moment you went to class and you actually got a small note from the secretary of your coffee cooperative society, you are allowed to be in class because there will be income, isn't it? There will be an income. What happened to cotton? I remember in age we tried to revive the cotton through Kipra. I remember Rose, we provided uh, resources for that, to revive cotton industry. Uh, is it AERC or I'm trying to... No, I think it's through IDRC. I was in IDRC and I was sending resources to Kipra to try and help revive the cotton industry. That was... In the, in, the, in the early years of uh, like 2002. And uh, those are just three examples. We can talk about contract farming in Bari. We can talk about what happened in so many other places. So many others. So what happened? Then we ask, what happened to their production and productivity? What happens to the investments that were made? The whole issue when we talk about markets and when we are looking at these issues is that if you cannot appropriate returns from your own investment, then those investments and even, even business will die. Because you invest on the basis that you are going to get returns. So, in this case, the markets were interfered with and the market development the market protection and the market regulation failed. So we call it an institutional failure problem. And an institutional failure problem will automatically lead to a policy failure problem. And uh, it is very important to acknowledge that and to know the mistakes and to correct the mistakes. 
So that institutional failure problem pushes policy failure, and the outcomes you see now are just the results of that. So when we talk about bottom-up, we are trying to say, how can we resuscitate and solve those problems? The abject poverty we observe in some regions has thus a bearing on institutional and policy failure problems. Thus, it is important to create interventions at the bottom of the pyramid to make markets work for them. When I was writing this uh, speech, I was telling myself that, you know, I can talk about markets until cows come home, just because I have a strong belief in markets. But I will save you from that. I will try just to make sure that I'm brief. But I do believe in markets. And I think it has nothing to do with me as a regulator. Because I also, in one of my uh, tour of uh, policy duty, I have been a regulator. I used to say that once a regulator fails, then the market will also fail. It's an institutional failure problem. But let me come to the second question. Why economic transformation? This is an area that Kipra has done very well. I remember commenting on this, some, some, is it last year or something? On econ why economic transformation has failed in one of your seminars. It is something that I have worked on in my own life because economic transformation is very, very critical. There are two driving factors that, are, that, that have failed us. One of them is human capital, and human capital actually can actually be related to capital accumulation. And you can even, even say, get one small indicator, one single indicator called savings, even though we, we would like to look at the totality of capital accumulation. For us to ignite sustained economic transformation, we need to raise capital accumulation to thresholds that can ignite economic transformation. In actual fact, even structuralist economists have come up with such argument that we have thresholds. We have, to ignite, we have to get to thresholds that can ignite economic transformation. One of the examples that I have always looked at is the East Asian tigers. And Kenya actually adopted export-led model, believing that we can reciprocate, or le sorry, the, the, we can actually uh, uh, recreate a transformation from ourselves looking at uh, East Asian tigers in terms of economic transformation. But the East Asian tigers spent about 50 years in terms of human capital uh, development, human capital development, before we could even see that uh, transformation. So, what we need to do? For us to raise the human capital levels, we need to invest in education, we need to invest in health, and we need actually to think about the nutrition outcomes that we really want, and even how our labor markets work. All these are interventions that are required, and we want to make sure that once we do that, we can boost the human capital development. This will support critical leadership in institutions, by the way. And this is why the better agenda is important to us as it touches on every segment of the economy and its future transformation. Two days ago, James and I were making a presentation to the cabinet in terms of uh, economic development, and we had, uh, you had a graph showing where the low middle income countries are. And it was actually fascinating to show that the low middle income countries, if you take a 20 year span, their growth trajectory has been trapped at between three and 5%, at most 5.5%. And we even wanted to show that. The question to ask is, why do low middle income countries, or even middle income countries in general, middle income developing countries, get trapped? It, they stagnate in, in a sense. You look at just low growth 
and sometimes a secular decline on that growth. So you can see that there are structural issues that are inhibiting them from breaking away. And that is why those aspects of human capital development becomes very important. I can digress a little. Just when we were seeing the conclusion of uh, the global financial, uh, the, the global crisis of the, the pandemic, the Ukrainian crisis, somebody, especially the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, asked me, Jugona, what can we do to start talking about economic recovery in African economies? And by the way, Automatically, I didn't even have to start lighting a, 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 a paper on that. I just said four, four areas I require. And the first one was human capital development. The second one was markets. And because today I'm going to talk about markets, I will not talk about it here. The third one was domestic resource mobilization. Because you can't finance your budget unless you have an appropriate structure and even strategy for domestic resource mobilization, which means is taxation and the instruments of taxation. In Kipra, we did a lot of that, of that work in 2000. And that's why we are igniting the similar work at the Treasury right now to come up with optimal instruments of taxation. And the fourth one was to say, we failed in, a, in our import substitution strategy. We have failed in our export-led growth strategy. Isn't it? That's for Kenya, isn't it? Everybody is telling us now that let's try to see what we can move into to try and ignite economic transformation. We don't need a model. We need an agenda that is very, very important. So if we have done that, we need a structure that is going to help us. And that is why we are saying the fourth industrial revolution is actually going to be uh, uh, driven by technology. That is why we are emphasizing the digital evolution or the digital transformation that is helping us. And that is why the bottom-up economic transformation agenda is taking those as very important component. It's a digression, but I can tell you you can write a lot about those four areas and you can actually find answers in our own way of responding to economic shocks that are hitting us. They will be found in those four areas, both in the short term and in the long term. Ladies and gentlemen, let me come to the role of markets because it is at the core of economic transformation agenda that we are talking about. As markets provide the platform for investments, and they also ignite production and productivity downstream. And this is very, very always important because if this is the trend we are taking, then we have to ask, ask ourselves, then how do we make the markets work? It is in the markets where economic rents are shared and distributed. And therefore, it is very critical that we develop, then we protect the markets, to make sure that they function as required. We, now, we have to nudge the market to the optimal path so that they can realize their full potential. And then when we have done those three things, the final part is to regulate them. Use the legal framework to make sure that you regulate them. They remain within. If you do those four things, you will find that markets will work for everyone. Look at it even from the localized area. By the way, Chairman, when I was a young boy, when things were so tough and you are, you are suspended from school because of fees, we used to go out to the market to sell the goods, goods, isn't it? And sheep. Sheep were the most troublesome, eh? because they don't take the route. Goods are easy. But when you get to the marketplace, the rural marketplace, there were sections, isn't it? This is where the goods are sold. And isn't it? You remember that? Yes. These are vegetables, these are fruits, these are clothes. Yeah? Have you gone to those markets? 
today? Have you tried? Have you tried? And by the time when you enter the market, there is somebody saying, oh, you are selling vegetables, you are going to that section. Oh, of course, you are going to that section. There was order, isn't it? Today, has anybody tried? Please, I'm not turning it into a classroom, but I just want to give practical examples of why, what has failed, isn't it? So, that city, that council, county council government is actually collecting revenues from those people coming to the market. And the market days were known, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with having a market every day. But it is important to know that there was a market day for this market today. You know the other market. In that region, you know what is there, isn't it? Uh, you know what is good in that market. So on that market day, I'll go to that market. And that mar markets function and optimize themselves because they are organized. The moment we destroy that organization, first, is the information flow dies, isn't it? You don't know what to go for in that particular market or in another location. And secondly, they don't optimize. They don't optimize. So the quality of the market and the consideration of a market fails to make any meaning. Just think around wherever you come from, especially for us who are destined rural guys, just think about that and see what has changed. It's the organizational structure. It's the institutional DNA that has collapsed. And we have to go back to organize the market so that they can realize their potential. I told you that I can talk about markets until cows come home. But I, let me not uh, go beyond that. Let me say that by regulating the market, I mean that the regulator must first define the rules of the game and the legal framework that supports that rule of the game. And secondly, define an appropriate reward or even penalty system. We call it the incentive framework in, 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 uh, in economics. So that we, what we are actually talking about is the reward system. And the appropriate rules of the game and well-defined incentives framework will encourage prudent behavior in the marketplace. And that is what we strive for. And that's why market function, because there are rules of the game and there are incentives. And that's how markets function, and that's how they are sustained. And I can reiterate, where you see markets failing, it is because the institutional DNA has failed or has not been followed, and an institutional failure problem will emerge, and you cannot track prices of products, because you, I used to say, when you see the prices of products, what does it reflect? It, it reflects either the scarcity or abundance of that product in the market. So when you talk about cost of or prices of goods, and prices are high, it's because they are reflecting a scarcity. And one of those scarcity in well, in no, in when we don't have well-organized market, the scarcity value takes, uh, takes over. It is not the scarcity, but also the scarcity value, because markets are not properly organized. For properly organized markets, you can actually diminish the scarcity value, and the true scarcity can be reflected. The development of markets and, other, uh, uh, and their efficiency is critical also for attracting investments, allocating resources, and in incentivizing firms. When investors are able to appropriate returns from their own investment, the momentum for investment and market development builds up. In fact, uh, I was uh, like now, it is, um, the tea, those who come from the tea sector, I moved away from coffee sector after the collapse. By the way, you, uh, you can see the economist in me is also practical, isn't it? Since I cannot influence this market and it has collapsed, let's go to another market which is functioning and see whether we can influence it. So they are now announcing bonuses for coffee, uh, for tea farmers, for those who are there. One of the things is, I used to tell uh, my students, we would have analyzed what is happening when there is a, a bonus being announced. The most important thing is that it tells you that you're going to be paid on the basis of your produce, isn't it? 
So in a sense, it is signaling that you have to start, if you want more money in future, you have to start increasing your production. But it also tells you that even what you are getting is dependent on your cost structure. So it's also telling you that if you want more money in future, you have to increase your productivity. So in a sense, when we talk about markets, we say that downstream, it encourages increased production and increased productivity. And upstream, what you're going to see as a smallholder farmer like me, you're going to see incomes increasing, isn't it? That is the whole incentive structure of markets. And for us, we are very, very important. So the development of the markets and the efficiency is a critical factor for attracting investment. And that is why we keep insisting and adding that to, to the arguments that we have so that we will encourage everyone to look into the markets where the solutions will be. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic on the cost of living is very near to every household. Every Kenyan is worried about the high prices we are experiencing that keep rising with no end in sight. The talk is in everyone's lips, in the streets. Why does everything seem to cost more? While decision makers, on the other hand, are grappling with policies to hold down the upon crime on prices, they have to ignite production in future. But there is a simple reason why the cost of living is increasing. It is explained by past shocks and even past policies. The shocks from pandemic, the drought, the supply disruption coming from uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine and conflict led to massive government spending. And above all, the drought effect was actually to shift resources from core areas to even save lives, including even uh, saving the wildlife. So it is an accumulation of so many effects that even the flexibility at the fiscal level was becoming problematic. The spending that went to social protection programs, to cushioning businesses, and in even individuals, actually, especially with the diverse effects of COVID-19 and the provision of subsidies for fuel and other critical food items, and even the provision of relief for regions negatively impacted by the drought, were quite massive. And they were massive at a time when there was no fiscal space. Now we are paying back for the, perhaps, those effects of our previous policies, but not only through, are they coming through resource question in terms of how do we get resources to recover, but also through the effect of higher market determined prices. Because the scarcity value and, and also the demand in the market is quite problematic. Everybody has even talked to me about a change rate position and also has impacted on the on, uh, negative effect on prices and also higher import prices, but even has created an effect on our public debt. Higher interest rates and even loan repayments are becoming quite critical. We used to say that it's like a, uh, an, an, an organized system of making sure that you fail. Mm -hmm. it's a, we always call it a conspiracy, a conspiracy, isn't it? It's a conspiracy theory. But if you go to every country in Africa, you find the same thing. Can you really go out from this trap? And that's why I started by saying Low-income countries have this drop. It's a journalist who called me and said, told me, didn't call me, he sent me a text and told me that um, the uh, 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 JP Morgan has actually said that Kenya is in a tightrope uh, because of the economic situation and the euro board. I said, look at all the low-income low 
middle, uh, sorry, low middle income countries in Africa and elsewhere. You find that they are all in a tightrope. That's why I started by showing what James Muhatu was showing in the cabinet two days ago, that we are all clustering between 3% and 5.5%, and isn't it? If you net out the population growth rate, that's real growth, isn't it? You see that what you are left with cannot even, even make any effect on per capita income, isn't it? So essentially that trap emanates. You try all the dimensions. So we know that these are effects that are going to be with us for a long time until you ignite some structural transformation or reforms that are going to be important. The exchange rate depreciation, for example, changes the relative price structure. And this affects domestic price structure. Yesterday in Parliament, I was asked the same question. And I say it's a combination of first, if you are importing more than exporting, it means you are using other people's savings. It is show us, shows up in current account deficit. And that will drive nominal depreciation. If you prevent the nominal exchange rate from adjusting, then you get into a misalignment. And then you have to pay for that. You have to pay for that readjustment because the nominal exchange, exchange rate is the automatic stabilizer. You have to allow it to adjust so that the misalignment in the real economy is not reflected in the real exchange rate. It is a tight discussion, but it's a commonplace discussion at the same time. But I do know that I was telling some friends of mine that let me not go into that because it's going to be a tight discussion and uh, I will be accused of not speaking English because essentially we will start from what happens to the real exchange rate and non tradable sector. And if the non tradable sector is booming, for example, we are constructing loads and all that, it's booming, it's affecting non tradable prices. If that is happening, then you have to allow the automatic stabilizer to minimize any form of misalignment. I'm sure here there are so many experts in this area. Rose is one of them. I have Dominic Jinkel. They know these things. We, talk, we talked about them in the 90s. And we are still talking about them, by the way, even when we had different exchange rate regimes. But when you have a flexible exchange rate, a floating exchange rate regime, then you are assured of automatic stabilization using the nominal exchange rate. But the moment we constrain it, then we are in trouble. That's the first thing I was told by the bankers when I joined this tour of duty. But <clears throat> we have taken steps to rectify that. It is working. It's only a matter of time that we see the full results. Ladies and gentlemen, the government has undertaken policies and, and, and projects that will eventually lower the cost of goods and services in the country. But even when we take that, we also have to take emergency measures to try and uh, take steps in terms of what we are seeing. For example, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think after this meeting I will be rushing to a position where everybody has heard about El Nino, haven't we? But nobody has asked the question, what are we doing to protect ourselves from that? Not only from livelihood point of view, what about the stocks of food, isn't it? In regions in Kenya where there is the, our bread, uh, our, bas our basket, our excess basket comes from, isn't it? At the time they will be harvesting, it's also the time the El Nino will be hitting in, isn't it? So we need a lot of preparedness. It's not just talking about it, is taking measures, Mr. Chairman. This is why that is a meeting I'll go after this. But even in our own individual households, we should actually, because the individual household is a major decision maker and a, and a major investor. And even any precautions that are taken are taken at the uh, household level. That's why we are even improving investments in this area of meteorological services so that we get adequate information and process that information to safeguard ourselves from such shocks. As we have seen, we could not have predicted the, the COVID-19, isn't it? But the drought itself hit us harder than anything else. 
So you can see the combination of the drought and the, uh, the sort of the COVID and the drought. So that in future we should be more active and more preventive, especially when it comes to climate change, because it's going to be with us for a long time. The government has, in, for example, implemented fertilizer subsidies to boost production. And here, the government used the, the e-voucher system to make sure that you not only deliver fertilizer to the farmers after the census of uh, farmers, to know exactly even the kind of fertilizer they need. That production is not, a, it's not, it's not accidental. It is because of patterned even fertilizer uh, uh, application on specific areas that fertilizer is used is going to make a difference and that's why it has made a difference and um, the cabinet in August 2023 approved partnership between the National Serious uh, and Produce Board and county governments using efficient e-voucher system and that was also supported by a census for farmers to know their location to know their, their, their need, and then we used other information to know what kind of fertilizer is needed. So one th thing was done was mapping the farmers even during the registration, and the fertilizer cons uh, that was provided was consistent with the requirements they needed, and at the onset, we have seen that the bumper harvest that we are going to experience would be a reality in terms of what we may need to do in future. So far, we know that we are going to get very good uh, harvest. And the next question is, how are we going to deal with post-harvest losses? The government has rolled out county aggregation industrial parks as well. They are aimed at strengthening agricultural value chain, including micro and small enterprises and more so to encourage aggregation for value addition in dairy products, edible oils, leather, cotton, building materials, and even natural resources. I've gone to some regions in this country, and when I talk to county governments, I tell them, most of the time we talk about low-hanging fruits, but here where I am, I'm seeing that the fruits are on the ground. You don't need to lice up to, to, to pick the raw hanging foods. They are on the ground, you just pick them. There are so many opportunities of helping the, uh, the smallholder farmers through aggregation principle that we are very good at, isn't it? Our cooperatives from time immemorial have worked very well. I started with coffee cooperatives. We have seen tea. We have seen so many others. So it's a form of aggregation. We have seen the dairy industry just being transformed overnight. I was reminding some people with a research that we did in that we a survey research we performed in 1987 with World Bank on unit cost of our industries, and ended up in KCC. And what we found was profound, and we said the government should liberalise this data industry. It took long. I made some brutal recommendations, so nobody was happy with me. That was 1987. But two years later, they realized the reality. Today, you cannot even compare what, hap what was happening around that time and today. It's because we ignited a very efficient aggregation and value addition process. And that is what we want to make sure that we do. And that is what we know that we can ignite the relative comparative resource uh, uh, capability of different counties or comparative advantages of different counties in terms of resources by using that uh, industrial uh, county aggregation industrial parks and even encouraging investment in those areas. It can make, make, make change and even show us the growth poles and stimulus coming from different countries. In addition, in November 2022, the government established established a National Steering Committee on Drought Response to lead uh, the efforts towards mitigating the emergencies that are coming up from drought situation in the country. And of course, most of you were with us in African Climate uh, Summit 2023. And you noticed some of the examples that are coming up to actually show us that climate change is with us. 
for a long time. It's going to be unpredictable. We want to, to make sure that we take advantage of the information set that will be generated and invest in areas that can cushion us. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, access to affordable and inclusive finance is important at the end of the day. We have to invest, but the whole issue is where do we get the finance? We need to support investments. Those investments will support production in the economy. It is also supports consumption smoothing for by households by minimizing adverse impacts of shocks. And that's why the intermediation in finance becomes very important. The low income households, including medium and small enterprises, often face significant barriers in accessing afford affordable finance. And that's why the government launched the Financial Inclusion Fund, or what we call the Hustlers Fund. And it's, a, it's an in intervention that was launched in November 30th, 2022, to promote access to affordable credit while concurrently encouraging savings. And this is important for us. It is actually some way of trying to say, how do you cushion those small traders Individual it started with the public fi personal finance, and further, the government uh, launched the Kenya National Entrepreneur uh, Savings Trust (KNEST) in March 2023. And what it is doing is to target uh, it targets to provide inclusive pension security to about 16 million workers in the informal sector. What these two initiatives are doing is actually to help and support uh, households and small businesses. As at the base of the pyramid, in line with the bottom-up economic transformation, giving them capacity to invest, to save and invest. As I started by saying, capital accumulation is going to be the answer. Savings are going to be the answer. But then we have to find avenues of doing that. We cannot use the existing models. We have to come up with new solutions, because those new solutions are quite aware of what is happening at the bottom of the pyramid. Finally, let me say that human capital development is critical for the market and even economic recovery, and even helping us reserve, uh, sorry, reverse the trends of, in the cost of living. The components are also important. One of them is targeting health, targeting education, nutrition, and labor, labor market. A skilled labor force is a key priority to enhance production and auxiliary social economic transformation. You have seen going into, even though we are talking about value addition in those critical areas, you have seen that labor and labor quality is very, very critical. It's going to be there. I think the other time we were doing some projects on um, youth employment with uh, Brookings Institution, isn't it, close, with Kipra and the ARC. And we were looking at the whole of Africa and the situation is dying. On this front, what I do believe we are going to do, especially in the labor market and even labor force, the key milestones is going to be the implementation of competency-based education reforms to build strong human capital base. That is going to help us in terms of managing our processes. And the government is undertaking reforms in health healthcare sector system so that every Kenyan may soon be able to receive quality health you saw that on Monday, the, uh, the initiative that was, uh, was ushered in, and it is going to be ushered across, um, across, uh, across uh, 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 county governments, and this is very important. Let me now turn to some highlights on the Kenya Economic Report 2023 that are central to reforming the bottom-up economic transformation. Given that inflation is largely a food phenomena, boosting food supply through such measures as smart agricultural practices, strengthening kitchen garden technologies, and even post-harvest ma management are going to be very critical. And we should start with this season, which is going to be bumper. But unfortunately, we are not ready to deal with the post-harvest uh, constraints that we face. It's going to be very, very critical. The interventions together with measures to strengthen food manufacturing value chain, among others, where medium and small enterprises are involved in, in food processing, is going to be very, very important so that we create diversity and economic activity around that. We cannot, we, 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 we cannot just 
sit back and watch uh, our post-harvest losses coming through. The county aggregation industrial clusters planned to be rolled out in all the 47 counties will support these initiatives in the future, but for now, we have to lay a base in terms of what we need to do. The end results will be a, a functioning market for food that will create activities downstream to increase production and productivity. Energy prices is the second largest contributor to inflation, coming uh, only after food. Households spend about 10% of their expenditure on transport, with a substantial exposure to international oil prices that are passed on to the local pump prices. In line with the bottom-up economic transformation agenda, adoption of e-mobility is therefore strategic even at the household level or even at the individual level in reducing reliance on fossil fuels and energy prices. This is supporting the initiative to lower greenhouse carbon emissions with commitments on nationally determined uh, contributions in the short term and also the use of government-to-government -government oil importation that has provided cushion, but, uh, but the global prices are, are rising faster now than we had anticipated. I was, in, I was incensed by the whole idea of misunderstanding the government-to-government -government oil importation, G2G, and some newspapers were actually saying that it has exposed the country to exchange rate misalignment and to exchange rate pressure. I had to do a statement to explain the facts because most of us want to rely on facts that you are not facts. And I put in, oh, thank you. I put in a, subs, a very, um, a, a very uh, factual statement of different facts and even the outcomes. And I do hope that from today, or from yesterday when I provided this, we can quote the real facts. I even provided the data. Because when we address constraints, we can address them in a simple way, but the most important thing is to address them in a simple and sustainable way. The more complex, the more unsustainable. G2G is just a simple way. Trade finance has no risks. And I think, Rose, I need to get some, I, mean, I know there are experts in trade finance in your team. We need to tell people that trade finance, there is no risk. So G2G cannot expose the currency. I don't know where those people, I, I don't want to talk about school because in my life, most people know me for those areas. Look at my works, you'll find that I revolve around price determination and more also exchange rates. Those, that's why I had to write those facts so that when we quote, we quote real facts. The second aspect is actually addressing trade distributional bottlenecks, which is an important consideration as well. And here, we want to rely on digitization and digitalization agenda that will pr produce unique opportunities to of overcome in information barriers. Now, Tonry, in aspects of prices, but also on what is available in the market and where it is available. We can solve the information search costs. We can solve the information asymmetry problems just through digitization. By the way, the young people have taken it faster than we do, isn't it? Have you ever asked your kids, if you have any, uh, a question? They will quickly Google, isn't it? do the phone and give you the answer. So we have solved the information asymmetry, but we want, we want to take it higher up at the economic level where we are dealing with production and um, marketing decisions. That's what we really need to do. Further, we want to enhance price discovery of agricultural products. We want to fast track the implementation of the central registry by the warehousing, by the warehousing receipts, uh, and that's a system that we want to form, and it's very vital. We then move even to commodity trading, and this will, among other things, promote real time.
for monitoring food and food stocks, which will help us inform decisions on sourcing and even distribution of foods across the country, and even having solving that problem of storage and even thinking about it. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry. In conclusion, I want to re-emphasize that to effectively address the high cost of living, it requires enhancing productivity and implementation of market-enabled long-term solution. It will be just production, productivity, increasing production and productivity. That's the one side of the constraint, one one side of the spectrum. Enforcing and enhancing markets to make sure that they work for everyone. That is in the middle of it. And in the, the other end, we are going to see incomes increasing. That's the only way we are going to solve that problem. I want to encourage actions at all levels, both at the national level, at the county government's level, to consider the recommendations from the Kenya Economic Report 2023 by KIPRA, and we reiterate some of the considerations and even examples that have been provided and even the advisory solutions that we should take. So I reiterate that these recommendations support the bottom-up economic transformation agenda on productivity growth and market-based solutions for empowering Kenyans. Markets are sustainable, and that's the only way we can be sure that markets will be there for us tomorrow and the future, and they are going to be sustained because they will be there because there will be demand. I also underscore the government's commitment to supporting KIPRA in playing its strategic role in building capacity, providing evidence-based policy advice, providing technical and advisory services, and even creating platforms for engagement of stakeholders so that information is understood, policy advice is understood, and the practical aspects of implementation are understood. When I joined uh, the African Economic Research Consortium that has trained most of the economies from 1980s in Africa, one of the things I had realized is that when we started African Economic uh, Research Consortium, there were no national think tanks. And we started, it was a reaction from, it was a, poly, a reaction from governments in Africa that they were failing to implement structural adjustment policies. They were rejecting them, not because they were in any way bad, but they were not well understood. So ARC decided, the starting of the ARC was that, let's build capacity so that these policies are understood, and once policies are understood, they can easily be implemented. But when I joined, uh, rejoined, by the way, I rejoined because I've been in and out of uh, AERC, I realized that in the five-year strategic plan, we need, now that we have think tanks, we need to have a network of think tanks in sub-Saharan Africa. Because the think tanks provide advice to governments. We want to elaborate that, to encourage that space, to internationalize that space because AERC is composed of a larger network involving the whole world. We have, we can source any experts in any part of the, of the world. We have the capability, the AERC has the capability to actually provide even support direct, direct to a think tank so that the ideas are there. And that is why it becomes a stakeholder. That's why one of the objectives was to make sure that we network think tanks so that they can actually provide a platform for policy influence. That's why it is very important I come to that level because at the, at the, at the level of engagement with stakeholders, it's very, very important that we broaden the intellectual base, but also the advisory base that is disunderstood. Having said all that, by the way, I stopped saying with those few words because I'm not known for saying a few words. That's the, te that's the teacher in me. It is with those so many issues that we can always stop me anywhere and ask me questions, but I will still have a good answer. Let me say that it is now my privilege and honor to declare 
the Kenya Economic Report 2023 officially launched. Thank you, God bless you, and let us use those advisory points, those practical areas that we need to implement policy. Let's, let's use them. Let's them. Let us push our economic frontier using those advisory uh, comments. It is during crisis that it is we reform. Uh, by the way, I forgot to give you that example, that it is during crisis that we can reform. And this is the time to take those drastic measures, and we are very happy about that. Thank you very much, and God bless you. All right.